Hi folks and welcome to this first episode of History with the Lotus Eaters. I'm joined by Bo Dade, who you may know from his writing on LotusEaters.com or from the YouTube channel History Bro. He's been writing uh, articles for us for a while now and they've been fantastic. So I asked him if he wanted a job and thankfully he said yes he would. And so we are we are here to be able to talk about interesting things from history. Uh, this, this first episode, we're going to be talking about the voyage of Hanno the Navigator, who was a Carthaginian admiral who was tasked to go and explore out beyond the Straits of Gibraltar, uh, two and a half thousand years ago, roughly. And we have the sort of logbooks of his journey, and it's fascinating, and so I can't wait to get into it. So, Bo, hey, thanks for being here. Thanks for joining us. No, it's an honour and a pleasure to join the team. Um, uh, I think you've said before you just wanted to make history content. Well, that's, I'm the same. Yeah. I just That's what I've always kind of wanted to do. Um, so... Yeah, no, it's it's great. I can't really uh, say how much I'm looking forward to making content on the regularly. Yeah, so and so good. just uh, just to make uh, people aware of like your background, you've got a degree in ancient history and politics. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, undergrad in um, ancient history, um, mm -hmm. which is the same as classics, really. But I just didn't read things in the original. So yeah. <laughs> you didn't read it in the ancient Greek and Latin. I didn't know because yeah. I didn't go to public school. No, um, did I? <laughs> yeah. um, and then yeah, I got a master, and then got a master's in. Um, uh, government policy and politics. Right. So, uh, yeah. yeah, but my real love is history or ancient yeah. history, all history really, but the ancient stuff. Yeah, I, yeah. I, the ancient stuff, there's a kind of romance about it, isn't there? Oh, for sure. You yeah. know, where it's, it's something like, it's not like modern S, you know, sort of post medieval history. There's something really different about it. But right. So, who, who was Hanno and where did he come from? Right. Well, I mean, that's a good question. Uh, and the details are quite there's not a great deal of detail so who exactly Hanno the navigator was isn't entirely clear some say he was a king uh, one of the inscriptions say he was the king of Carthage mm. but but right away there it's like can that be right Carthage didn't have kings did they so maybe that's a well as I understand it Carthage did originally have a royal family but became a republic before Rome did is that was, there, was it the Maganoids? Is that the Maganids, name? Yeah. Maganids. Yeah. Um, so I think, uh, well, Hanno, the navigator, is a member of that family. Hmm. But I was reading that it might be a Greek translation to, of king. It's not truly a, a monarch. It's just a magistrate of some type. Yeah, so the, the Greeks um, would have said Basileus for leader. That's it, Basileus, right? exactly. Yeah. So, so it could have been any kind of rank, high yeah. rank that they didn't understand. But it's like he's the guy in charge, right? He's the Basileus, got it move on right. so just to call him king it's not necessarily like a, a no. medieval english king yeah. but but it might have been who knows and that's the great thing about history especially ancient history um is that there's there's so many gaps that you can just fill it in however you like there's so much uh, scope for just your imagination mm. and i think the story of hanno navigator is got that in spades because there's there's so little really yeah it's, we haven't got a whole book We've no. just got a few inscriptions. Um, so maybe that's a good place to start where you said there's, um, how did you put it, that we've got some, his... his um, a logbook. A logbook, yeah. yeah. Well, what it was, was apparently his, at the time, i.e. the 6th century BC, so quite early on, really. I oh, mean, yeah. way before Rome came to any sort of prominence. Yeah. So the 6th century BC is really quite early. Um, they, after they survived this journey, this adventure, and they came back and they in, made inscriptions in stone, which... Uh, stayed in Carthage until the end and uh, anyone that knows their history will know uh, how Carthage ended in yeah. 146 BC it wasn't very peaceful yes Carthago de Linda Est indeed boy. Yes. <laughs> Carthago de Linda Est so but that's way in the future uh, at this point in the 6th century BC Carthage was powerful but not really at the zenith of its power mm. um but they decided that they would need to, because they were a, a, a trading, commercial, mercantile. Yeah, as I as I understand it, Carthage was founded by Tyre to be a merchant port on the North African coast, because Tyre being in the Middle East, um, and the Middle East being the sort of nexus of trade across the entire sort of Eastern world going into the West, um, they were essentially planning on simply just setting up trading ports to allow goods and service, uh, goods and money to flow. But Carthage, because of its particular location, happened to grow really, really quickly. And so it was founded, I think, in the 9th century BC, something like that, something like 8, 812 BC or something like that, during a period of a, a rapid colonization from not just the Phoenicians, but also the Greeks uh, of the Mediterranean. And Carthage happened to have an advantageous position 
uh, good good fertile soils, and it grew really, really big and powerful until it was way more powerful than Tyre itself. But there was always this kind of uh, deference to the mother city of any colony, wasn't there? Um, it was just the custom of the time. But uh, but yeah, so this Carthage is only like 300 years old at this point. It's not an, not an ancient, well, I suppose from their perspective, maybe that's quite old. But even then, is that old from their perspective? Because Tyre was probably, you know, thousands of years old. Yeah, much more ancient. So like the Carthaginians yeah. are Phoenician. Yes. Um, that's what you would say, isn't it? And Tyre is in uh, modern Lebanon, just by northern Israel, Lebanon, Syria. There, it's not million miles from Beirut yeah. and Damascus. So it's it's that part of the world, exactly. And at the time, um, it was an island as well, uh, which which changed when Alexander the Great arrived, and and it stopped being an island. <laughs> but um, but the point is that the the kind of people we're talking about are very much the Middle Eastern Phoenician. Uh, descendants of and so they looked like middle easterners so they they looked like pretty much modern middle easterners now pretty much and they had middle eastern religious traditions so they they had the uh sort of canaanite pagan pantheon basically didn't they yeah it certainly wasn't the later hellenistic one no. that people might think of that, yeah. that sort of dominated the mediterranean yeah. world that's that's later that's yeah. hundreds of years but yeah so they had um yeah a, a completely different sort of cultural tradition to the greeks yeah uh, yeah. So yeah. So they 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 had gods like what was it Melkart and Baal, and they, so all, all of the sort of gods that sound even Moloch is is a, is attributed to the Carthaginians, which we're not even sure if that's a god or a process. But the you know, <laughs> right. but, well, it, the, the the there are inscriptions that suggest that Moloch like children were sacrificed to Moloch, is, is, and which is not unique to the Carthaginians. Like the Romans sacrificed people, you know, lots of Ke- the Celts sacrificed people. This is something that just happened in the ancient world, isn't it? Um, is, is Moloch the Bohemian Grove thing that Alex Jones? Well, I, it, that's what the that's what the inheritance <laughs> of it has become, but that's probably not what it meant to the Carthaginians. Yeah, I doubt it's the exact. Same. Same yeah, <laughs> tradition. But, yeah. but like, you know, Moloch, Baal, Melkart, you know, all of these are now the evil sounding gods of myth and legend that the Christians pathologize. Uh, but to the Carthaginians, these weren't evil. These were just, you know, the, the gods of the world, like Zeus, Athena, and Poseidon. Yeah, like, uh, well, it's funny you mentioned Poseidon. Uh, one of the inscriptions um, will we'll talk about how it's been translated by the Greeks, and mm. they say Poseidon, but. It wouldn't have been Poseidon. It would have been their Phoenician uh, ocean god, which I think is, they called Yam. Yeah. So not many people will ever have heard of Yam. No. Um, it's sort of almost lost to time. Yeah. Uh, but of course, the the Greek or Hellenistic translation of that is, is just they just say Poseidon. Yeah. Because this was common, wasn't it? This syncretic mm. syncretization mm. of the religious custom, and the, the Celts did it with the Greeks, and you know, so because everyone had essentially the same pantheon, but just with different names. So anyway, and as you say, um, the 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 position of Carthage was very good. Mm. It seems because uh, it's not right by Gibraltar. It's not right by the Rock of Gibraltar, but it's not a million miles away. Way. And it seems that they were certainly able to dominate that region, yeah. uh, which in and of itself, for various reasons, uh, could or did kind of dominate trade in the Mediterranean and beyond the Atlantic coast of Europe and North Africa. Well, it all sort of flows through Gibraltar one way or another. Uh, Gibraltar? Do you mean Sicily? Uh, no, Gibraltar. That's at the very far left, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. All oh, st- oh, right, the, there was the, trade going through. The it, whole right, yeah, route yeah. of the Mediterranean yeah. Yeah. and... Yeah. The Atlantic coast there. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So Carthage is sort of right in a good, yeah. really prime spot to take yeah, advantage yeah. of all of that. Yeah, because, I mean, it, it wasn't it wasn't too distant from Greece. It was right next to Sicily, which meant right next to Italy. And, of course, then you've got the sort of Celtic lands to the, to the uh, west. And so Carthage is just in this amazing position. And even better for Carthage is that it's got essentially a giant desert to its back. And so you, you don't expect, I don't know, 100,000 Germans to come marching over the sand dunes or anything. You know, that just didn't happen to the Carthaginians. And so there's no other great powers on the North African coast. And so Carthage has just got all this free real estate that it just sits there and goes, okay, we'll colonize, 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 colonize. And that's actually what Hanno's journey was about, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And I, th- I think it's important to point out, again, that they didn't have any giant rival like Rome. Yeah. Or they were, during their period, there wasn't some strange invasion by like a Mongol type or Attila the Hun type, something crazy out of left field. Yeah. Uh, so they were, yeah, in their period, they had, I don't want to say relatively easy go of it, but they, they you know, trade exploded. They had all, they trade had all the advantages. Yeah. All, all the advantages yeah. you could yeah. have asked for. And they were naturally, as Phoenicians, a seafaring people. Yeah. So that wasn't something they had to sort of... Um, they inherited that tradition. Yeah, like the Romans had to work really hard to become good yeah. at navies and things, yeah. whereas it seems the Phoenicians, it was just their thing already. Yeah. Um, uh, but nevertheless, it's interesting that 
um, it seems that Hanno, of course we don't know what, what information is lost, but it seems that this Hanno, the navigator, is one of the first to explore outside or, or the Atlantic coastline. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's interesting in, in and of itself. I mean, he's, he's certainly the, <clears throat> the first person that we have on record from the Mediterranean arriving as far down the, the coast of Africa as he did, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. And then another thing, another interesting thing, I think, is that it's, it seems that after that, the next full account we've got are uh, uh, Portuguese people. Really? <laughs> like nearly so, 2,000 years later. God. So, I mean, what he did was genuinely ahead of the curve. Way ahead, yeah, <laughs> way ahead. Yeah, talk about a pioneer, hmm. pioneer with bells on. Uh, yeah, I think that, because, of course, we had people like, I say we, the British had people like uh, Hawkins and Drake, yeah. uh, a few generations after the Spanish and the Portuguese started going around Africa. Yeah. So, yeah, Hanno the Navigator in the 6th century BC is uh, just way, way ahead of his time. Um, but, yeah, so I thought maybe we could talk about, just uh, briefly, mm -hmm. Um, ancient geography or the, the cartographers and if anyone that studies history or is a classicist or does ancient history at uni or anything like that one of the names you'll probably be aware of is Strabo Strabo the geographer yep. um, I remember when I was at uni on nearly every reading list almost regardless of what it was there's Strabo you kind of have to read Strabo yep. um, and some people it's just pure gold they love it they can't get enough every line almost is, is like gold dust and others find it a bit dry and boring. I must admit, I'm somewhere between the two. When it's a when it when he talks about something I'm interested in, it really is like, oh, wow! Every every line, it's great. Yeah. Um, and then other times he goes off on a tangent, like Herodotus. You're like, what's this got to do with anything? I'm not interested in this. Suddenly we, you're talking about something. I'd... We will do a defence of Herodotus at some point. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Because uh, uh, Herodotus has been much maligned, and I don't want to, but I won't go into now. <laughs> <laughs> well, so yeah, you've got Strabo. And Strabo lived in the age of, um, well. Uh, Sulla, Caesar and Augustus his life is very similar he was born and died very closely to, to Augustus so we're talking the last decades of the BC period and into the very first decades of AD so that's when he was and the first picture we've got here is a, a sort of a famous map of, of Strabo's this mm. is the sort of map that, uh, that the, the Romans in the age of Augustus say thought the world looked like or or at least it was their best sort of guess or guesstimate and as you can see a lot of it's fairly accurate i mean the mediterranean coastline is not mm. you know around greece and 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 italy and there it's all you know it's all there you, you can see that it's just about how far they happen to have traveled at this point right because mm. like you you can see well they they know there's uh, there's an island off the north of europe we don't know much about europe and it goes across and then you go into the black sea and then asia's enormous and we don't really know where that goes so we'll just round it off at the end and now oh, there's a point there oh, india over there yeah and then we've got africa which they call libya just down there and that goes around for ages and we don't really know but we've got the persian gulf there we've got um the arabian gulf and so yeah i mean it, like you can see what it is you know it's not it, it, it's not like inaccurate it's just primitive yeah exactly and you can see they you know they're aware of britain up there mm -hmm. um but obviously just haven't Don't really it. <laughs> mapped it properly uh because of course caesar jumped across to britain didn't he but it was a yes. very small sort of thing it wasn't till claudius yeah. so claudius is post strabo so no wonder they don't know but it's funny to look at africa yet yeah, there they just call all of africa libya mm. Um, and it, it's funny, it's like, what we don't know, we'll just assume there's nothing there. More, we'll more. just assume it's ocean. <laughs> what, what are you going to do? Fill it in from your imagination? You know, it's, what well, choice do they know. have? I mean, if you look at our uh, sort of the European uh, early modern uh, maps, they'll say, we don't know. So they just sort of leave it blank. They don't assume there's a coastline there. Yeah. I mean, maybe it's maybe it's being unfair what they've done on that that map there. But at least we would say... For example, when we knew of the east coast of America, but we didn't know how far it went exactly. Yeah, they'll just say, blank. yeah, yeah. Um, so that's the limit of the the Roman world. But we're talking again about five hundred years before this. Yeah. <clears throat> so there. So as as distant from this map to uh, to to Hanno is the same distance between us and like Henry V. Yeah. Exactly. You know. Exactly. Yeah. So, so a fair chunk of time. A huge amount of time. Yeah. Um, so if, if Strabo is kind of the gold stance, one of the first 
ports of call if you're interested in ancient geography or ancient cartography or ancient map making or anything. Strabo is sort of the go-to place. But he is, as I say, sort of a culmination. This is actually quite sophisticated, really, considering. Um, and there's lots of other names. There's sort of um, Ptolemy, that, that's the, the astronomer uh, stroke scientist Ptolemy, not the Alexandrian Ptolemy. Yeah. There's many Ptolemies in history. Uh, you know, Alexander um, had more than one geographer. Aristobulus is sort of the famous one. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, in the Iliad, <clears throat> pardon me, in the Iliad, um, there's quite um, quite a lot of description of exactly where different islands are. This is more the Greek world, sort of the yeah. Ionian world. But nevertheless, there's, there's a few ports of call when you want to look at what how the ancients viewed their world. Um, there's, there's a Greek and Athenian called Pythias mm-hmm. who was supposed to have... Uh, I think he's roughly contemporaneous with Hanno, talking sort of 6th century BC, who was, they say, perhaps went as far north as uh, Britain and even Iceland, even perhaps Scandinavia. But a lot of people say... I mean, Strabo thinks that Pythias is making it up. Really? Yeah. Um, But nevertheless, he does have a few details which... um, Can be corroborated? Yeah, yeah. Well, he said... Pardon me. He said that he came to... uh, No, more thanks. uh, He he found pack ice. So he might have gone as far as the Arctic Circle. Uh, And he said that... (sighs) He he, he called that the end of the world, the edge of the world. If you can't sail any further, that's the end of the world. Hmm. Yeah. but like I say, Strabo says that's a liar. <laughs> but I mean, but who knows? We know that that exists, so exactly. maybe he did find it. Exactly, and um, I, 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 th- I think he did probably circumnavigate Britain because he seems to have described the Orkney Islands. To watch the full video, please become a premium member at lotuseaters.com.